Hi, my name is Jody Lyons. I'm the CEO of Senior Sherpa and your host today for What You Need Your Need to Know. And I'm here today joined by Dr. William Manspach. He is a specialist in evaluating and treating memory and mood disorders in older adults and the founder and CEO of the BCAT. This approach is a cognitive and mood assessment tool and it's used by thousands of people worldwide. Today we're going to be discussing what you need to know about anxiety and depression and why that's important. Dr. Manspach, I'm thrilled you're here. Thank you. Happy to be here, Jody. So my first question is, what is depression exactly? And does it look different in older adults than it does in, say, somebody in their 30s or 40s? Very good question. Very complicated issue. Probably complicated because depression is both, both a lay term and a clinical term. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you're really asking about what does it look like clinically, right? Right, okay. right. So essentially there are different features of depression. Most of the time we think about it in terms of an internal state of feeling sad or the external state of looking like a person is sad. Mm -hmm. But there are other features to it that you should really recognize. So some of those are physical, some of those are impact on well being, some of them are cognitive, and let me give you some examples. So, so typically speaking, of people who are depressed, whether they're older adults or, or younger adults in some ways. So there tend to be changes in appetite, changes in sleep, uh, something called social withdrawal, where people tend to tend to spend more time toward them, you know, to, with themselves rather than with other people. A very important feature is called anhedonia or apathy. This is okay. when people are less uh, interested in doing things that used to bring them pleasure in some ways. And, and in fact, among older adults, that symptom, anhedonia, is mm -hmm. particularly important among some of the other ones. So it sounds like the things you've just described actually could be seen by a layperson. Mm -hmm. You know, saying we're going to visit our parents at a holiday or for a vacation or things like that. Um, are, are there other symptoms we should be looking for? I mean, basically what I'm asking is, how do we know if there's a problem that we need to know about? If this is an older adult mm -hmm. where depression is suspected, certain things that you should look, uh, look, look at uh, that are particularly unique. So, okay. so one of them is cognitive, right? Okay. So you, know, you think about it among older adults, what's the number one worry or problem? Oh my gosh, do I have a memory disorder? Sure, like they're all worried about and so Alzheimer's and dementia. So what complicates that is that for older people who are depressed, there often is a co-occurring problem with memory and cognition, memory in particular. So as we are older and we are mm -hmm. depressed, we are um, less able to make memories. Now, that's usually a temporary situation, unlike a condition like Alzheimer's disease. So depression, in fact, can interrupt, interfere with an older adult's ability to make new memories. That's one thing that is different. So if you're with uh, an older parent and all of a sudden mom doesn't seem to be able to make memories in, uh, in the ways that she used to, she's mm -hmm. more forgetful, it may indicate a cognitive problem, but it also may be the result of depression. One should really look at that first. So somebody who used to be an engineer who can't figure out how to use the remote no matter how many times they're shown really could be suffering from depression, not necessarily dementia? It's less on problem solving. It's okay. probably more about just um, remembering, being more forgetful. Okay, so the losing the keys and forgetting to turn the oven on when the turkey's in it. Right, so, so okay. memory is an issue. Okay. Um, older adults tend to um, report being depressed. Uh, I feel depressed. Uh, they tend to report that less so than younger people do. This mm -hmm. could be a generational difference and mm -hmm. not being comfortable. Uh, in, in reporting symptoms, psychiatric symptoms. And there tend to be um, more of an emphasis on somatic or physical aches and pains. GI, stomach issues, headaches, things of that sort. It doesn't mean that you couldn't be younger and have those symptoms, but they're more pronounced among older adults who are depressed. So an older adult, who, older adult who's depressed might actually just say, my stomach hurts, or not want to eat a holiday dinner, claiming that their stomach hurts or their head hurts or they just don't feel well. Mm -hmm. And so it's not necessarily just a trip to 
their internal medicine person. It could actually mean they need to be screened or tested or is there something you can do to screen them? Sure. So so we can talk about screening. I think we will. And we can okay. talk about treatment because it's important. Right. And depression is one of the most successfully treated psychiatric conditions. Or so there is conditions. something you can do about yeah. it. So, okay. so we can talk about you know, how to do that, uh, what sort of the process is uh, in terms of that. But what I would say is if, if you're a family member or a concerned friend, mm -hmm. um, the most important thing to look at, uh, the two most important things to look at, one, it would be this issue of anhedonia. I mean, okay. so Bob all of a sudden, who uh, was an engineer and right. was really interested in those kinds of things, yeah. suddenly is not anymore. So. Or, or the mother who doesn't want to cook dinner right. and always used to love to cook. Right. Yeah, it doesn't, okay. doesn't necessarily mean that he or she is depressed, but it may be an indicator. Right, I, I did have a client one time who said, I'm 85, I've been cooking for 85 five years it's somebody else's turn yeah, so that, that, that just probably might, not depressed. that's probably just yeah. reason yeah. rational yeah. exactly so. exactly the other thing I'll point out that I think is a difference is that every now and then unfortunately people who are depressed have thoughts of self-harm what we think of right. as suicidal ideation um, among older adults uh, those statements are more associated with lethality than with younger adults what, what I simply mean mm -hmm. is that if an older adult says uh, I want to kill myself Whereas we should always take that seriously mm -hmm. when someone of any age says that it's particularly the case for an older adult because the percentage of, of completed suicides is highest among that age group relative to all the other ones. So what do we do? But let's say we're in a situation where we're with a family member or a friend and those of us who are a little bit younger think there might be a problem. I mean, obviously, you're now saying we do need to look at it. Older adults will commit suicide. I mean, that's a myth that they don't. So what do we do? So two pieces of good news. Okay. Uh, so the first one is really assessment. There are some evidence-based assessment tools that are highly accurate at identifying people who have probable depression. The purpose of a screening tool is not diagnostic. It's to say, hey, this person really needs to be evaluated by a professional. Right. The one that we recommend the most is called the BADS. It stands for Brief Anxiety and Depression Scale. And we, and we, we recommend it the most for several reasons. One, it can be done in 90 seconds, so Great. it's really fast. Okay. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be you know, a mental health or, or other kind of uh, healthcare professional. It's also something that can be completed by an older adult, but if, they're, if they don't want to, they're not cooperative, it can be done as a proxy uh, assessment, which means that... So I could, for example, yes. fill out this or take this test on behalf as of long family as you, members. Right, as long as you, you really know the person, mm -hmm. right? Uh, if you know the person well, you're a, a key informant, then right, you could right. do it with high Can't accuracy. Can't just go do it for random people, right? That's right. So, um, and the other advantage of, of the BADS is that it's sensitive not only uh, for people who have possible depression, but also those who have anxiety disorders, particularly something called generalized anxiety disorder, and okay. hopefully we'll have a chance to talk more about that. No, I that hope so. Today. That's really important. So, so what one would do is you would do the BADS and then you take the, those results if they look like there's a problem uh, to a healthcare professional, let's say start with a primary care physician uh, for a formal evaluation and mm -hmm. then we can talk about that process and of course treatment, which is the other, the other good news because as I said, depression is a, is a very treatable condition in most people. Uh, can you give me some examples of how you could treat? Sure. So what is good for older adults is the same sort of prescription of sorts uh, for younger people. And, and really what I mean by that is a combination of two different approaches. One is medication-based, the other mm -hmm. one is what is referred to as non-pharmacological or non-medication-based. Okay. So we have a number of different antidepressant and other medications, mood medications that have been found to be um, effective, mm -hmm. tolerated by people for the most part with a minimum of side effects, although often there are side effects, of course. Um, and uh, when medications are combined with the talking therapy, um, particularly a, something called cognitive behavioral therapy, Jody, which I think, as you know, really identifies uh, thought processes, thought patterns that mm -hmm. contribute to uh, and keep depression going in some mm -hmm. ways. When, when a person is treated uh, with, those, with those two things, uh, the probability of success is, is, is rather high. 
Medications, I would say almost 90% of medications that are prescribed for people mm -hmm. who are depressed are prescribed actually not by psychiatrists, but they're prescribed by primary care. Right. However, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has to be uh, conducted by uh, someone who is licensed and skilled in that mm -hmm. area. It could be a psychologist, it could be a psychiatrist, social worker, and other people as well. So I have another question, which may sound a little odd, considering we are talking about depression. But how, how come some people just aren't depressed? I mean, when you look at a group of older adults, they've lost their children, they've lost a spouse, they've lost their house, they've had to move, many have had to leave communities they've lived in their whole lives, many have financial issues. So why is it some people get depressed and some don't, particularly, particularly in that age group? So this is a wonderful question that you have. Uh, you know, you think about the stereotype of the older adult, someone who is frail and lonely, living alone. Right, right. Uh, maybe the phone's cut off and there's not enough mm -hmm. food in the refrigerator and so forth. But uh, whereas that, that certainly happens, it's, it's, more, it's more mythic, actually, than, okay. than, uh, than, than real in many cases, fortunately. No, I think I would say, as, a, you know, as someone who was involved in geriatrics, that older adults are, as a group, amazingly resilient and resourceful. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, if you think about aging from this perspective, Jody, from a lifespan perspective. Mm -hmm. So if you are in your 70s, 80s, 90s, and 100s, mm -hmm. you are by definition a survivor. You have had so to endure, long, right. and not only that, you've had to solve problems along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody makes it until their seventh and beyond uh, decade without having struggled, without mm -hmm. having had to deal with significant losses. Now having said that, there are unique loss situations among older adults that I think bear um, talking about, uh, but also we should think about depression as related to some of those factors. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that in your work you see um, three or four of the most significant contributors to depression. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and if we if we really think about what those are, we think about retirement as being one. So that yes. usually uh, historically that's been the younger, older adult. Although right, now right. that's changing. Right. Many positives about that. So residential or sorry, uh, retirement is one. Residential mm -hmm. relocation is another. Uh, people move from their homes of 45 and 50 years mm -hmm. uh, to assisted living or, or other kinds of living situations or with family members and so right, forth. Right. And spousal loss in particular has been associated with depression. Now most people who have those conditions survive beautifully. Every now and, uh, every now and then though um, one has depression. The takeaway is screen treat. Thank you very much. When we come back, we'll talk about anxiety in older adults. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined, but there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. Uh, 
I'm Jody Lyons. I am the host of Your Need to Know, and today we are here with Dr. Mansbach. We are now back to discuss anxiety in older adults. So first things first, what exactly is anxiety? I hear people say, I'm stressed out, or I'm really anxious. What does it really mean? So once again, we, we have a term that's used as a lay term. I'm feeling okay. anxious, I'm feeling worried. And then we have a clinical term. Same word means okay. different things. So the most important difference is one of severity. Mm -hmm. So when people have one of the five major anxiety disorders, they have a disabling mood condition. They feel certain things that I wish I will describe in a few moments. Uh, that interrupt daily functioning. So if people are working, it intrudes in their work life. Mm -hmm. If they're not working and they're at home or doing whatever they're doing, it often intrudes uh, in such a way it becomes almost space occupying. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so it has to affect daily life. Mm -hmm. Are there physical symptoms that manifest sure. or? Sure. So uh, let's let's begin with the subjective psychological symptoms okay. of anxiety. So we think about them as any number of mood features. They could be excessive worry, okay. right? And by excessive, I mean worry that's disproportionate to what the event is. Okay. A silly example could be uh, a person who is, uh, cannot get out of their mind whether or not they locked a door. Or right, right. Even, though, the even though they've never not locked the door. Right, right. right. So it's sort of an anxiety level that's a uh, worry level that's um, out of proportion. Uh, so, so a feature of that, Jody, is, is not being able to control it. Right. In fact, it's it's the thought. It's mm -hmm. the thought that begins to control the person in some way. So so subjectively, it's about worry. Uh, it's about anxiety. Uh, it's that state of a little bit being unnerved, uh, but it's out of proportion to the actual event. So that's sort of kind of one way to think about it. Okay. But there can be there can be physical symptoms as well. Uh, they can be uh, in the form of of sweating, periods of sweating, mm -hmm. uh, acceleration in heart rate, uh, clamminess, uh, a sense of sort of out of bodiness, things okay. of that sort. Um, the anxiety disorders, of which there are many, famously known as phobias, for example, right. um, obsessive compulsive disorder, and so mm -hmm. forth. But I think the one that is most relevant for older adults is something called generalized anxiety disorder or GAD okay. and I say that because uh, it's it's fairly common uh, we go through periods of GAD among older adults anywhere studies uh, range from anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of an older adult at That's some point okay. is going to have not not just be anxious but actually have this episode, this condition, this intrusive anxiety condition. So it's anxious enough to actually affect their daily living. Right. And that high a percentage of older adults have that? I, I wasn't aware of that. Right. So, so it doesn't mean that, that um, among all older people at right. any one point in time, in between 10 and 20, 25 percent have it. It just means that through the course of the older adult years, uh, between 10 and 25 percent will, people will yeah. have an, at least one episode like that. And, and let me point out, if, uh, one of the differences with older adults and younger people, it's very important, is that for older people, having GAD usually stems from an actual condition. And the most common one okay. would be falls. So if you so think about you explain it. Yeah. that? I, did, I would never put falls and anxiety together. Right. So it turns out, if you look at the science, um, and we, we look at this at our research center, as do other, other researchers, mm -hmm. that um, the, the prevalence of falls among older adults for lots of medical reasons, healthcare reasons, is fairly high. Nearly 50% of people who have had a significant fall, not just a spill, but mm -hmm. a fall that's resulted in actual treatment, hip fracture, rehab, mm -hmm. things of that sort, right. about one in two are going to have some episode of GAD related to falls, and it's usually a worry, is this going to happen again? And it's perfectly so, understandable. So it's the fear of falling again actually turns into a GAD? It does. and and. And one of the problems is that when people have GAD, uh, let's say in terms of uh, falling, 
Uh, then one begins to narrow one's world. I'm not well, going to go. Exactly. I'm not going to leave the house as much. I'm because not. I might fall, and it's too hot, or it's too cold, or the ground's too uneven, or right. Right. So when you and think then they of, get socially isolated. Sure. So think about your clients, for example. Yep. When w it, that can lead to self isolation, it mm -hmm. can lead to a lack of cognitive stimulation. It can then begin to have cognitive memory, you know, implications. So, so things begin to unravel, which is why it's very important to identify people who have GAD and like with depression. Depression, it's quite treatable, but um, you can't treat something that you don't first identify. Exactly, and I'm glad you brought up cognition. So one of my questions is, in the world where such a high percentage of people have some sort of cognitive impairment, whether it's mild cognitive impairment or dementia or Alzheimer's or another type of dementia, mm -hmm. Where exactly does anxiety and mood fit in with this? So, so you're talking about the sort of co-occurring conditions, yeah. right? That would be the technical term. Right, right. Yeah. right. So, so if a person uh, technically has dementia mm -hmm. or, or that pre-dementia syndrome mm -hmm. called mild cognitive impairment, MCI, um, the likelihood of having GAD or depression, for mm -hmm. that matter, is is high, uh, but it depends on where a person is in the process. And, and let me try to make it as simple as I can. Okay. For people who meet criteria for, for MCI, mild mm -hmm. cognitive impairment, and mild dementia, okay. uh, the probability of co-occurrence is about 50%. Wow, I didn't know it was that. Very high. Yeah. Interestingly enough, um, in moderate and severe stages of dementia, uh, particularly in Alzheimer's disease, the numbers actually drop down a bit. And they probably drop down because the awareness and insight that a person has uh, becomes, it begins to be diminished. You can, you can picture this. Mm -hmm. A person can be very anxious if they begin to have memory problems because right. they're worried, my gosh, what does this mean? What impact will it have on my life? Will I have to change my life in a very dramatic mm -hmm. way? It's only natural that there would be some anxiety there, mm -hmm. and that can snowball to what would be of clinical proportions, GAD, mm -hmm. or depression for that, you know, for that matter. So what do we do about it? Well, the first thing we do is we identify and we don't explain away. It's very easy okay. to say, well, you know, mom's just anxious or, or... I do hate that when they say just anxious, just depressed, yes, right. just uh, a little forgetful. Unlike with depression where there are any number of, of, of pretty sensitive uh, screening tools, mm -hmm. there are actually very few uh, sensitive screening tools for GAD. Um, I would mentioned in the earlier segment that we advocate using the BADS, the Brief mm -hmm. Anxiety and uh, right. Depression Scale because it's sensitive to both depression and GAD. So families certainly can complete a GAD, they can ask a healthcare provider to do it, or they can do it themselves because it takes 90 seconds to do and it's mm -hmm. um, it's reliable by proxy so that's the first thing okay so first is know what you're dealing with know what you're dealing with right okay I also think um, it's important Jody to recognize that um, physicians are much more likely to identify depression in their patients than they are GAD in their patients. So okay. if you're a family member uh, and you're watching this program, it would be important to be a strong advocate. Really you know, make sure that that physician is aware that mom really is indeed anxious. Anxious so much that it's impacting on her life. Maybe she's not leaving mm -hmm. the home anymore. Maybe she's afraid to, to do things that she's perfectly capable of doing cognitively and otherwise. Uh, physically. Now I'm going to throw a hardball question at you. Okay. Because we talked about anxiety, mm -hmm. we talked about depression, yeah. we talked about cognition. Yeah. Many of my clients are hoarders. Yes. Where does that come from? And, and the reason I'm asking is a lot of people go back to visit their family members, look around and say, mom used to keep a spectacularly clean house and now it's not. Mm -hmm. So what are we looking at and what does it mean and how does it relate to this? Hoarding is a, a specific condition. Uh, most people who have GAD aren't hoarders. By hoarders, these are people who hold on to objects, yes. typically objects, tangible objects, mm -hmm. beyond proportion to what they really should. So they may be people who collect and don't throw anything out. It right. could be, and you've, I know you've worked with many families that, yes. and you've seen this many, many times before. In these circumstances, anxiety may be a component 
to okay. the you know to the entire syndrome, but usually isn't the primary feature. Okay. So they could also have GAD, but GAD in and of itself is rarely the primary cause for hoarding. However, hoarders could also be very anxious that could contribute, okay. you know, as well. No, that makes sense. So they could be related, they probably are related, but they're yeah. not necessarily completely related. Right. It's not necessarily causality, as you would say. That's right. I would say okay. that. I would also say, um, from the standpoint of treatment mm -hmm. for not so much hoarding, because that, that's a, uh, in many cases a more complex situation, uh, but if you look at GAD and you mm -hmm. look at treatment for it, like with depression, most people who treat uh, generalized anxiety disorder are primary care physicians, mm -hmm. and uh, that makes makes a lot of sense. So the frontline medications for those are usually the anxiolytics, like the benzodiazepines, mm -hmm. Ativan, Xanax, things of that sort. But it is very important that uh, many of those medications, not all of them, but many of them produce tolerance, which means physical tolerance and uh, psychological dependency. Okay. So, so what I really mean by that, Jody, is that you can become a Addicted. These could be substances that are, are rather abusable, and mm -hmm. not only abusable by the person with GAD, they can be abusable it's by other people who know house. that a person exactly. has GAD. Exactly, exactly. Right. So if you add the fact that some people who have GAD also have cognitive problems, mm -hmm. the um, possibility of taking these medications in a way that's uh, different than how they were intended or prescribed becomes important. So family members really need to monitor, uh, I think, this, mm -hmm. this, this situation a lot. Well, you just actually raised the last point I want to talk about before we run out of time. We have about a minute and a half, apparently. The caregivers. So. The caregivers could be older adults themselves, they could be adult children who are still older adults, and it looks like we're talking about anxiety, depression, dementia, not being able to take care of themselves anymore in the older adult population, and now you throw in perhaps some misuse of mm -hmm. prescribed medications. Can you give me just a couple of tips that the yes. caregivers can do to take care of themselves? Right, so you said the most important one, take care of yourself. So caregivers, if you're, if you're caring for a person who has dementia, like Alzheimer's disease, you're five times more likely to, to have major depression, a major depressive episode. That's a lot. But also five times more likely to have generalized anxiety disorder or GAD. So in many respects, being a caregiver is, is a significant risk factor for your own health. So you can't take care of somebody else mm -hmm. until uh, you take care of yourself, not only first, but concurrently. So depression is treatable in patients, mm -hmm. treatable in caregivers, so is anxiety. And let me just add one more thing. Yes. Like with depression, medications can be helpful. They're rarely enough. So that's when a talking therapy, in addition to the anxiolytics or other class of medications, is really effective. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Madspot. My pleasure. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Jody.